Today we start at Genesis chapter 30. And this chapter concerns itself with the children that were born to Jacob. And perhaps we should back up just a little bit and set ourselves in the flow of the context here in the book of Genesis. Starting at Genesis chapter 12, God focused his redemptive work to work through a particular man and his descendants. That man's name was Abraham. And God made a very special covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. You could find it and look it up in the first three verses of Genesis chapter 12, where God promised Abraham a land, a nation, and a blessing. The land is approximately today what we would call the land of Israel, at least that general territory. The nation would be the people of Israel that would come forth from Abraham, uh, him being their ancestor. And the blessing would be the Messiah, Jesus Christ, through whom all the nations of the world in one way or another would be blessed because Jesus Christ is the savior, not only of the Jewish people, but he's the savior of the world. Land, nation, blessing, promise to Abraham in a covenant. Well, Abraham had two sons. Actually, he had more than that. I think he had seven in total. He had his firstborn son was born through an Egyptian servant named Hagar. That son's name was Ishmael. But he wasn't the one chosen to receive the covenant as an inheritance. Later, Abraham also had five sons through a woman named Keturah. This was after his wife Sarah died. But the son that was chosen to receive the covenant, none of those five sons of Keturah received this covenant inheritance. No, it was the son born through his wife, Sarah, born by a miracle. This son's name was Isaac. So the covenant passed from Abraham to his descendant, Isaac. Isaac had two sons. They were twins, actually. And God promised that it would be the younger of the two sons that would receive the covenant, sort of going against the grain, because in that culture, in those cultures, maybe I should say, the right of the firstborn was very strong and very well established. But God said, no, in this unique situation, it will be the older that serves the younger instead of normally the other way around. So the covenant passed from Abraham to Isaac to the second born of the twin sons of Isaac, and that would be Jacob as opposed to Esau. Well, there was a lot of conflict between Jacob and Esau, and through some very strange and, if I could say, um, sinful uh, acts and consequences, Jacob had to flee from his life, and he traveled to the east in order to find a wife among his cousins, the family of his mother. And so he ended up marrying a cousin named Rachel. But Rachel's father, Laban, was a, a schemer, a deceiver, a manipulator, much as Jacob himself was. And he sort of gave back to Jacob the kind of treatment that Jacob had given to other people earlier in his life. And it ends up that Jacob marries two women, two sisters, Rachel and Leah. Rachel being the younger, more beautiful, the favored wife. Leah being older uh, and apparently not as pretty, not as beautiful. Uh, Far be it from me to say that Leah was ugly. Of course, we don't know. But uh, apparently, uh, the contrast between Rachel's great beauty and uh, maybe Leah's normal beauty, the contrast was evident. So here's a man with two wives. And in Genesis chapter 30, excuse me, 29, the previous chapter we looked at, we see that Leah, very unloved in the marriage, feeling rejected because her sister is obviously preferred before her yet she under the blessing of god god seeing uh, her painful state shows mercy to her and she gives birth to four sons uh, reuben simeon levi and judah gives birth to four sons at the end of genesis chapter 29 so now when we come to Genesis chapter 30, and I half apologize for taking so long to get to the beginning here of Genesis chapter 30, but it's important for us to understand this context. Now we're dealing with Rachel, the other wife 
to Jacob, who feels very frustrated that her sister has given their husband four sons, very prestigious in that culture especially, four sons has has, uh, Leah given Jacob and Rachel has been barren thus far, unable to conceive. That's where we pick it up here, Genesis chapter 30, beginning at verse 1. Now, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, Give me children or else I die. And Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel. And he said, Am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? So she said, Here is my maid Bilhah. Go into her, and she will bear a child on my knees, that I also may have children by her. Then she gave him Bilhah, her maid, as wife, and Jacob went into her. Very interesting, this dynamic described for us in verse 1. Rachel obviously sees the four sons that her sister Leah had borne to their husband Jacob. And maybe for the first time ever in her life, of course, I'm, I'm making a little bit per, perhaps exaggeration, but, but it does stand out here that it says Rachel in verse 1 envied her sister. You know, Rachel was younger, uh, apparently more beautiful, uh, maybe had a personality to match, and we, we, we don't know all the details, but I wonder if that wasn't the first time in the life of these two sisters where Rachel actually envied her sister Leah. You know, usually it was Leah envying her sister Rachel, but now the tables are turned, are they not? And Rachel being so... Uh, unaccustomed to this position. Rachel being so unaccustomed to having her sister Leah preferred before her, she comes to her husband Jacob and says, give me children or else I die. Despite Rachel's great beauty, she was also near despair in this situation. You know, I, I think it's likely that Leah often thought, if I only had my sister's beauty and the love of my husband, I would be happy. But it's also likely that Rachel often thought, if I only had sons like my sister, I would be happy. Friends, let's remember something. Beautiful or plain, married or unmarried, having children or not having children, Everyone has their problems, and everybody needs to trust in the Lord. There's sort of a principle here that shows the believer the importance of not looking to how God deals with others, but instead to set their eyes on God himself. We can have a lot of counterproductive time and thinking in our life where we're very focused on how God is dealing with other people instead of concerning ourselves with what God wants to do in our own life right here, right now. And you see this intense competitiveness, hatred, animosity that goes back and forth between Rachel and Leah, who were sisters, who should have had a wonderful relationship one with the other but they did not. Now, before I move on, I just want to make one more comment here about this phrase, give me children or else I die. That phrase uh, through the history of Christianity has become a little bit proverbial of someone's passion before God. For example, I think it's said of John Knox, the great Scottish reformer, that when he prayed, he asked God, give me Scotland or else I die. It was that same sort of passion that, Lord, I I I desire this so great. My passion is so greatly exercised towards this that I feel that I'm going to die if you don't grant it to me. That's been used as sort of this, again, proverbial expression for someone's passion, their their, their great... um, 
uh, need in crying out in prayer. Well, that was certainly Rachel's situation. But again, uh, her whole dynamic here is evidenced in the phrases that she used. For example, in, in verse 1, it says that Rachel envied her sister. Uh, she cries out, give me children or else I die. In verse 2, it says that a Jacob's anger was aroused against a Rachel because apparently she was blaming him for her difficulties with infertility. I, I think we can say this that there's a lot of tension in this family. It's plain. Everybody can see it. Yet in it all, Jacob could see the hand of God. Now let's face it. Jacob stated this observation to Rachel in a way that was so direct that you would say it was cruel. Jacob's response to his wife, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Again, not, a, not a, a note of sympathy towards his wife, Rachel, even though she was the beloved one. Am I in the place of God? It's God that's keeping you from bearing children, not me. And again, we see Jacob really not being much of a sympathetic husband here. Now, I wonder, I wonder, and again, I'm going to speculate just a moment here. Uh, you, you can take this speculation for what it's worth. But it's possible that Rachel was quite vain and conceited. After all, think about this. Rachel knew that Jacob worked 14 years with no pay out of love for her. That's got to really build up the self-esteem of any woman, wouldn't it? M my man was willing to work 14 years with no pay in order to uh, have the right to marry me. Man, that, that's really got to make a woman feel good about herself. Now, not only did Rachel know that, but Rachel also knew that Jacob would not have worked one day for Leah. So it's quite possible, at least in my estimation, that Rachel was, in fact, rather vain and conceited. But she's so desperate to bear children. She's so consumed by this competition, by this animosity, that she does something that, in my view, is, is, is totally out of the question, totally out of understanding, but not for Rachel. This is how desperate she is. In verse 3, this is what she says to her husband Jacob. Here is my maid Bilhah. Go into her. And she will bear a child on my knees that I also may have children by her. Rachel's thinking like this. For whatever reason, my, my husband's blaming it on me, but for whatever reason, God has withheld the conception of children from me. I, I have relations with my husband, but I'm not getting pregnant. This has gone on for some years. I don't know what's happening, but I got to have children. So I... I have a maid. I, I have a servant. I have, I don't know what exactly, maybe in today's terminology, something like you called a personal assistant. I have a servant, a maid, and she is my close associate. She's with me all the time. I will put her as a substitute in my place. And much like Sarah gave Hagar to Abraham in a surrogate mother type arrangement. That's back in Genesis chapter 16. So Rachel gave her maid, Bilhah, to Jacob. Now, Fred, you've you got to consider this, of course. This is the ancient world. There is no technology for uh, artificial insemination. Rachel is giving her constant companion, Bilhah, to her husband for sexual relations so that Bilhah might conceive on Rachel's behalf. The, the children, so to speak, would be accounted to Rachel, but they would be born by Bilhah. Again, something of an ancient surrogate mother arrangement. And in this, Rachel uses the phrase, it's right there in verse 3, here's my maid Bilhah, go into her, and she will bear a child on my knees. 
Now that phrase, bear a child on my knees, refers to this ancient practice of what you might call surrogate adoption, where a, 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 a substitute woman, so to speak, is given to a husband, given to a man, uh, he inseminates her, she conceives, and then the child is counted not as being the child of the actual woman who conceived and bore her, but her master, her her mistress, I guess that's the word used in terms of, of a woman's relationship, the, the, the woman who she serves. And some people believe that this phrase, bear a child on my knees, the, the research I've done, this is by no means categorical, but some people believe that this phrase refers only to a symbolic placement of the child on the knees of the one who adopts it. In other words, the baby's born, it's, it's sort of formally presented to the adoptive mother, in this case it would be Rachel, and placed on her knees, perhaps as she's sitting. But other people believe, and I believe this is a minority, but I want to bring it up to you, other people believe that this believes to the surrogate, in this case it would be Bilhah, sitting on the lap of the adoptive mother, this would be Rachel, during both the insemination and the birth. Re referring to Genesis chapter 30, verse 3, the 20th century Bible commentary says this, quote, these words are probably intended literally and not merely as a figurative adoption. And so I just want you to see how desperate Rachel was to not only agree to this, but to suggest it, to champion this. And we should not regard the idea that Bilhah was inseminated and gave birth on the knees of Rachel as a certainty. We don't know enough about this ancient practice. And even if it was an ancient custom, it doesn't mean that it was followed in every case. But this certainly is a reasonable possibility and again points to the great desperation, I would say, on Rachel's behalf. But verse 4 says it, she gave him Bilhah her maid as wife. Now, this doesn't mean that Jacob actually married Bilhah. What it means is that Jacob did with Bilhah what a man should only do with his wife, that is, had sexual relations with her and especially with the intent of inseminating her, of having her conceive. Verses 5 and 6, And Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged my case, and he has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore she called his name Dan. Jacob's fifth son, born to him through Bilhah, the maid of Rachel, was named by Rachel Dan. Now, by the way, just the fact that Rachel named him shows that she's the mother. You know, it's the parent that has the right to name the child, not somebody else. It's almost as if, and I hate to speak this way because you think poor Bilhah, but as soon as the baby's born, Bilhah's kind of pushed out of the picture. But Rachel named the boy Dan, and that name means judgment. Because of Rachel's own envy, she viewed this child born by human scheming as a victory and a vindication for her. God has judged me to be as good as or as better as my sister Leah because now I have a son, even though Leah bore her four sons directly and uh, Rachel bore her son, so to speak, through a surrogate. That's why she says in verse 6, God has judged my case, and he has also heard my voice and given me a son. R Rachel felt that the birth of Dan was proof that God heard her complaint. She felt strengthened in the competition against her sister Leah. I kind of like what Darnold Gray Barnhouse said about this situation in his commentary on Genesis. He said this, quote, can a woman get so low that she will hit her sister over the head with a baby? Rachel did. And just goes to show that, yes, these women wanted children, but as much so that they, they wanted dominance, they wanted prominence in the home, that they wanted to be the favored in the home. 
And they're using this baby battle to compete with one another. Continuing on here, verses 7 and 8. And Rachel's maid Bilhah conceived again. Just pause right there. Rachel said this thing with Bilhah was so successful. Jacob, would you please go in to my maid Bilhah again? It wasn't just to do it once. They did it repeatedly. And she conceived again, verse 7, and bore Jacob a second son. And then Rachel said, with great wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister. And indeed, I have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. Jacob's sixth son, born to him through Bilhah, the maid of Rachel, was named Naphtali. Jacob, excuse me, Rachel gave this name, meaning wrestle or wrestling, because relationships in their home had broken down to the point where Rachel openly acknowledged the baby competition. The first one, judgment, I'm winning, wrestling, I'm wrestling. That's why she plainly says in verse 8, with great wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister, and indeed I have prevailed. Now, this seems strange that she would say that she has prevailed, because at this point, Leah had four sons, each born directly from Leah, and Rachel had two sons, both born not directly from her, but from her maid, Bilhah. And so it seems strange to me, at least, that Rachel would say that she had prevailed. But, but I think perhaps that she means this in the sense that now Leah seems to have stopped having children. That, that's what we saw at the end of chapter 29, that, that Leah had stopped having children after her four sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. Then two sons were born to Rachel, but only through Bilhah. What's Leah's response going to be? You, you don't expect her to, to take this without a fight back, do you? Of course not. Look now at verse 9. When Leah saw that she had stopped bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her to Jacob, his wife. And Leah's maid, Zilpah, bore Jacob a son. Then Leah said, a troop comes. So she called his name Gad. Leah, who had stopped bearing children, decided that she could use the same surrogate mother method to increase the number of children that were accounted to her. Therefore, she gave her maid Zilpah to Jacob, just as Rachel had given her maid Bilhah to Jacob. Okay, I, I don't want to sound crass about this. Forgive me about this, but... Doesn't Jacob seem strangely passive in all this? But I, I, I do w want to say, and again, forgive me for, for sounding just kind of, I don't know what better word there is about crass or maybe a bit rude, but Jacob's having sexual relations with four women. A and apparently he's just fine with that. N not only his two wives, uh, Rachel and Leah, but also their maids, Bilhah and Zilpah all in the name of this great baby competition. But Jacob's approval or disapproval, it's nowhere mentioned in all of this. Apparently, he's just fine with the whole arrangement. And verse 11 says that Leah called the name of this child born through Zilpah, Gad. So Jacob's seventh son born to him through Zilpah, the maid of Leah, was named Gad, meaning troop of good or troop or good fortune. The wives of Jacob continued to use their children as pawns in a power struggle within the home. You know, at the end of Genesis chapter 29, Leah gives birth to her fourth son, Judah, and she names him Praise. It's sort of indicative of the peace that she has. Uh, she's not thinking of her hurtful, neglected state any longer, but now she's just able to praise Yahweh, the covenant God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, apparently now Leah has lost this peace. So she's not naming her children, you know, things like praise or honor or glory to the Lord anymore. Now it's uh, military things, troop, you know, a, a, a group of soldiers or good fortune. She's thinking in terms of the competition again. Now, verses 12 and 13. 
And Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, I'm happy, for the daughters will call me blessed. So she called his name Asher. Jacob's eighth son, born to him through Zilpah, the maid of Leah, was named Asher, meaning happy. Leah was more concerned about the status that the child would bring her. Notice she says in verse 13, all the daughters will call me blessed. She's more concerned about that status than she is about the child himself. So what's our count so far? Well, at the end of verse 13 of Genesis chapter 30, we have four sons directly born to Jacob through Leah. Then we have two sons accounted to Rachel, but born through Bilhah. And then we have two more sons accounted to Leah, born through uh, her name, Maid Zilpah. So right now, the score, if you want to say it, it's six sons for Leah, two sons for Rachel. So let's keep going here. Uh, Verse 14. Now, Reuben, uh, this is the oldest son of Leah, uh, the firstborn of Jacob. Now, Reuben went in the days of the wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother, Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she, that is Leah, said to her, that is Rachel, is it a small matter that you've taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, therefore, he will lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. When Jacob came out of the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come in to me, for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes. And he lay with her that night. And God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my wages, because I have given my maid to my husband. So she called his name Issachar. Now, the mandrake, uh, first mentioned here in verse 14, that Reuben found mandrakes in the field. The the mandrake is a root. Uh, In in Hebrew, it's called the love apple. And mandrakes were thought in that time to increase fertility in women. And, And they still are thought to increase fertility in women, at least among some people. Because Leah had the mandrakes she knew that Jacob would have relations with her, uh, believing, of course, that there was a greater likelihood that she would become pregnant. Listen, I I talked a little bit about Jacob before and his seeming passivity in all of this, Uh, even though he was willing to have sexual relations with these four different women. I I will tell you one thing that Jacob did want. Jacob wanted a lot of children. And And in particular, Jacob wanted a lot of sons. Uh, Because in that day, in that age, especially in this kind of agricultural community, this this farming lifestyle, the the more hands that you had, the more sons that you had, uh, the, the more financially secure your future could be. And so it makes total sense that Jacob is like, well, I just want to do whatever's going to produce the most amount of children for me. So when Leah comes and says, hey, I've got mandrakes, and and we all think it's all understood, that's how she thought in her day, uh, this is going to make me more likely to uh, have children, then Jacob said, well, of course, I'll have relations with you this evening. Now, we, we don't know if the effect of the mandrakes was something biologically or that, that was effective, or if it worked more of a placebo. But under the guiding hand of God, the mandrakes seemed to work in the case of Leah and Jacob. You know, whatever strange agencies God may allow to be used, such as mandrakes, the real factor was God's sovereign will in this. Verse 17 says that God listened to Leah. I mean, the the mandrakes, if anything, were just an agency that God used. The the real thing that God did was he listened to Leah 
and she conceived again. But but I do want you to notice something a little bit in this um, conflict between the two sisters, Rachel and Leah, in regard to the mandrakes. Uh, again, if you remember, Leah's son, the oldest son, Reuben, finds the mandrakes out in the field, brings them to his mother. The, the, the mother, Leah, says, okay, great. Well, uh, I'm going to have relations with my husband tonight, and I'll have a higher uh, possibility to conceive. Uh, Rachel says, no, give those to me. You, you You've got four sons that you've given birth to. I've never given birth directly to any son. You have six sons that are accounted to you. I only have two. Give me those mandrakes. And Leah said, no way. And she used this phrase in verse 15. I find this phrase a bit remarkable. Uh, Leah used this phrase speaking to Rachel. You have taken away my husband. Now, what's interesting about this? is that Rachel was the loved wife. Yet, Leah insisted that Jacob was her husband and that Rachel had taken away her husband. I just find this such an interesting dynamic. You would think that Rachel would have claim to saying, hey, first and foremost, he's my husband. He worked 14 years for me. He values me. He's chosen me. Leah, he never chose you. Our dad had to sneak you in on the arrangement. You would think that Rachel would have this strong argument for being uh, the number one wife in the household. But Leah says very strongly, that's not how Leah thinks. Leah says, no, that's my husband whom Rachel took away. Now, it's true that chronologically, Jacob was joined to Leah first by deception through their father Laban. And maybe that's how Leah's thing. No, I'm his real husband because I was joined to him first. I'm his real husband because I bore him four sons directly and six sons in total. I don't know the exact dynamic, but I'm just fascinated by this phrasing in verse 15. You've taken away my husband. Leah insisted that Jacob was her husband and that Rachel had taken away her husband. Friends, this hostility between the sisters, Leah and Rachel, was both obvious and hurtful. It must have been terrible to live in a home where one wife believed that the other had stolen her husband from her and the other wife believed that she was the favored one. Now, all of this, and when we think of the tension in this home, this confirms the wisdom of God's original plan as expressed in Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 for one man to be joined to one woman in a one flesh relationship. Jesus later reflected on this. Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 19 verses 4 and 5 where he talks about this coming together of one man and one woman in a one flesh relationship. He said this was God's plan, and Jesus used the phrase, from the beginning. From the beginning, this was God's plan. And yes, polygamy was practiced in the ancient world. It's practiced in some places in the modern world today. But polygamy is also um, was not prohibited by God until the New Testament. But it was never, never a blessing to humanity. No, God said, from the beginning, his plan was one woman to be joined together with one man. And God taught humanity this through the book of Genesis. And when humanity fails to listen, we see this kind of conflict within the homes. Again, in the Old Testament, God never specifically condemns polygamy, but over and over again, he shows us these, uh, these glimpses of polygamous families, and they're always filled with conflict. They're always filled with, with great dysfunction. And again, look, we're, we're not trying to say that uh, where one man is married to one woman, that there's never any problems or never any dysfunction. No, of course, we know that's not the case. But God's teaching us in the Bible by giving us these profiles of polygamous families and showing us how important it is that one man be joined to one woman in a one flesh relationship. <laughs> By the way, later, some 400 years later, uh, 
Leviticus chapter 18, verse 18 will forbid the marrying of sisters. In other words, it'll forbid a man from marrying two sisters. And this whole terrible relationship between Leah and Rachel shows us at least one reason why. Now, this family, later on as we make our way through the book of Genesis, you're going to see this family shows a lot of strife, a lot of contention, a lot of bloodshed. Matter of fact, God's going to have to work a great redemptive work in this family to bring them back to a place of love and care and sacrifice one for another. And I'm talking about these sons as they're going to relate to one another later on. Friends, is that any wonder? Children will reflect the atmosphere of the home. And make no mistake about it, if there was a lot of conflict and competition and animosity between Rachel and Leah, that certainly worked its way out among the sons as well. In any regard, uh, Leah takes the mandrakes. I don't know how she took them, if she ate them, made a tea out of them, whatever it was, of course. She had relations with her husband Jacob, and she conceived. Verse 18 says, so she called his name Issachar. Jacob's ninth son, born to Leah, was named Issachar, meaning reward. Leah saw this son as a reward from God because she was generous enough to offer her maid to Jacob. She saw this as God's blessing. I gave my maid Zilpah to Jacob to have more sons, and God is blessing me here for that. Now, verses 19 and 20. Uh, then Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. And Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will dwell with me because I've borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Jacob's tenth son born to Leah was named Zebulun meaning dwelling and how how vulnerable Leah seems here in the pain of her heart she's still waiting for her husband to truly love her and live with her and she hoped that the great number of sons would win his heart to her now look at verse 21. Uh, Afterwards, she, that is Leah, bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. <laughs> Finally, after 10 sons, Jacob became father to a daughter through Leah, whose name was Dinah. Uh, apparently, there was nothing symbolically significant in her name. And all this happened afterward, after the birth of 10 sons. First four to... Leah. Then two through Bilhah accounted to Rachel. Then two to Zilpah accounted to Leah. And then finally two more rounding out the ten to Leah directly. And then finally a birth of a daughter. Now this ungodly competition had in one sense ended. The final score is something like this. Uh, if you're just counting sons, Eight sons accounted to Leah, six that she gave birth to directly, two through the surrogate Zilpah. Two sons accounted to Rachel, uh, neither one of those coming from her directly, both of them through her surrogate, her maid Bilhah. Leah and the two maids would have no more children from this point on. I can't remember which commentary I read it in. It might have been Donald Gray Barnhouse. But he sort of pictured this as being uh, as if the, the wives here are playing poker. They're, they're bidding against each other. And I, I think it could have been Barnhouse. It could have been somebody else. But it, it was something like this. Uh, I bid one wife loved and beautiful. Well, I bid one wife and four sons. Well, I'll match your one wife and raise you a concubine. And the concubine's two sons. And then the response is, well, I'll raise you another concubine and two more sons by her, plus two more sons on my own, and then I'll throw in a daughter. 
And then at the end of it all, Leah says, I'll stand. Here I am, one wife, one concubine, six sons, two more sons, and one daughter. That's how it ends. Friends, in this competition, at this game of poker, so to speak, let me tell you, nobody was the winner. Now, we haven't thought about Rachel for quite a while, have we? And uh, Rachel there, there's got to be a bit of sadness there. She has the love and the favor of her husband, but her sister has eight sons, six of them born directly, plus a daughter. Then finally, we come to verse 22. Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. Friends, whatever sins Rachel may have committed in her pride or in her competition with Leah, God had not forgotten her. God loved and cared for for Leah. We see that in the story. But he also remembered Rachel. And in verse 22, we see after many years that the Lord opened her womb. You know, the idea of God's sovereignty over the womb is a repeated theme in the Bible. The purposes of God, where he may grant children to one and deny children to another, those purposes of God may be completely unknowable to us. But God nevertheless has his purposes. We've seen this a couple times already in the book of Genesis. God granted twins to a previously barren Rebekah. God withheld children for a long time from Sarah, the wife of Abraham, but then eventually enabled her to miraculously conceive. And then, of course, as I just mentioned to Rebekah in Genesis 25, God opened the womb of Leah. We saw that in the previous chapter, Genesis chapter 29. Later on in 1 Samuel chapter 1, we see that God will close the womb of a woman named Hannah, but only for a time until she gives birth to a son named Samuel, who's going to have a special place in God's plan. But in this case, verse 22 tells us that God remembered Rachel and God listened to her and opened her womb. And then we go on to verse 23. And she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. The 11th son born to Jacob through Rachel was named Joseph, meaning, may he add. Rachel felt that she had been vindicated by the birth of the one son. But this is what's interesting. Even as she feels the vindication with the birth of Joseph, she still longs for more children to continue this competition with her sister Leah. I think there's something sad in that. Rachel, why can't you just be at peace? Why can't you just be grateful for this one miracle son that God has given you? A son that God, by the way, will greatly use in his redemptive plan as things work out in the book of Genesis and beyond. But her first thought in giving the birth is, well, I want more sons. She names the son, may he add, may God add more sons to me. Yes, Lord, thank you for this, but can you give me more? Yet verse 23 says that she lived with this sense. God has taken away my reproach. At this point, one might think that this 11th son would end up being the key son God would use to further his redemptive purpose through this family. Now, it's true, this 11th son, Joseph, will play an important role in God's unfolding plan for the family, but he will not be the one through whom the Messiah would come. No, God didn't do it through the firstborn, Reuben. He didn't do it through this specially born, Joseph. God would bring his messianic line through the fourth born son, sort of unexpectedly, 
through Judah. You know, it's true that God's ways are often above and beyond the ways of man. So, friends, let's think about it before we go on to the next verses here. Uh, What do we have here? We have, uh, first of all, four sons born by Leah, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Those were the sons born there in chapter 29. Then here, starting in chapter 30, we have the birth of Dan, that's the son of Rachel, but through Bilhah. And then we have the son Naphtali, the son accounted to Rachel, but born through Bilhah. Then we have two more sons born to Zilpah, the birth of Gad through Zilpah. Uh, again, born to Zilpah, but accounted to Leah. Uh, you have Gad, uh, that is the seventh born son. And then following, you have Asher, the eighth born son, again, born to to Zilpah, but accounted to Leah. Then after that, you have the birth of Issachar, born to Leah. Uh, After Issachar, you have the birth of Zebulun. Then you have the birth of Dinah. And finally, we conclude after 11 sons, we have the birth of Joseph being number 11. We're going to come back to the sons of Jacob later. There's still one more to be born And the story around that is very poignant and very interesting. But that's for a later chapter. Let's continue on here in chapter 30, where we see uh, Jacob's relationship with his father-in-law, Laban, starting now at verse 25. And it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph, that Jacob said to Laban, Send me away, that I may go to my own place and to my country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you, and let me go. For you know my service for which I have done for you. And Laban said, Please stay, if I have found favor in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. There came the day, and this happened after the birth of eleven sons and one daughter. Uh, Surely you're talking about a period of fifteen to twenty years, whatever it would be, that Jacob says to his father-in-law Laban, Verse 25, send me away that I may go to my own place and to my country. Though Jacob was in Haran with Laban and his daughters for more than 14 years, he knew that he belonged in the land that was promised to him by God. Though the covenant made with his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac. God promised that by covenant to Abraham and Isaac. That covenant was passed on to me. This land of Canaan is promised to me by God's covenant. You see, after well more than 14 years, Jacob still called the promised land my country. Now, Laban's response was, did you notice that in verse 27? Please stay if I have found favor in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. Laban knew that Jacob was an invaluable worker for him. Laban said that he gained this knowledge, that this knowledge was learned by experience. And literally, that means learned by divination. It's probable that Laban practiced uh, occult divination. And by this, somehow he knew the source of his blessing was really Jacob in his life. Verse 28, uh, here we're going to see Jacob negotiating a deal with Laban uh, so that Jacob can start building a flock of sheep and goats for himself. Here we go, verse 28. Then he said, this is what uh, Laban said to Jacob, uh, name me your wages and I will give it. So Jacob said to him, Well, you know how I've served you and your livestock has been with me. For what you had before I came was little and it has increased to a great amount. The Lord has blessed you since my coming. And now when shall I also provide for my own house? So he said, again, this is Laban speaking to Jacob. What shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. If you will do this thing for me, 
I will again feed and keep your flocks. Let me pass through all your flocks today, removing from there all the speckled and spotted sheep and all the brown ones among the lambs and the spotted and speckled among the goats. And these shall be my wages. So my righteousness will answer for me in the time to come when the subject of my wages comes before you. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the lambs will be considered stolen if it is with me. And Laban said, Oh, that it was according to your word or that it were according to your word. And again, this is his way of saying yes. You see, as his wages from Laban, Jacob would take the speckled and spotted offspring and uh, separate the currently speckled and spotted offspring from the rest of the flock. Uh, this would sort of set the more speckled and spotted offspring or the probability of having them uh, against him. If you allowed the speckled and spotted sheep to remain in the flock, it would increase the likelihood of more speckled and spotted offspring coming from the flock at large. Laban loved this agreement. He says in verse 34, Oh, that it were according to your word. This was an agreeable deal to both parties. First of all, it was a foolproof way to distinguish between the flocks of Laban and the flocks of Jacob. You didn't need to brand them. Just look at those sheep or the goats. You can tell by their coloring to whom they belong to. As well, Laban liked the deal because the odds were set in his favor. And I would like to think that Jacob proposed this arrangement because he was willing to trust in God. He said, look, I'm going to keep these flocks the best I can, but at the end of the day, it's up to the Lord how many speckled and spotted offspring come from this flock, and God will choose what my wages should be. Here in verse 35, we read, So he removed that day the male goats that were speckled and spotted, all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had some white on it, and all the brown ones among the lambs, and gave them into the hands of his sons. That's what Laban did. Then he put three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. Jacob would care for the large flock of his father-in-law Laban, made up of solid-colored animals. And then Jacob would receive any speckled or spotted offspring of this flock. Now, obviously, if there was any way that Jacob could encourage these solid-colored sheep and goats to bring forth spotted and speckled offspring, well, that would increase his personal wealth. But what they did was they put, as verse 36 says, three days' journey between himself and Jacob to prevent the mixing of the flocks. Jacob's sons took care of all the existing speckled and spotted sheep and goats, uh, keeping them a three-day journey from the main flock. And then Jacob, as it says there in verse 36, Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. He took good care of what Laban had. Now pick it up again, starting at verse 37. Now Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar, and of the almond and chestnut trees, peeled white strips in them and exposed the white which was in the rods. And the rods which he had peeled he set before the flocks in the gutters, the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink, so that they should conceive when they came to drink. So the flocks conceived before the rods, and the flocks brought forth streaked, speckled, and spotted. Then Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face towards the streaked and all the brown in the flock of Laban. But he put his own flocks by themselves and did not put them with Laban's flock. And it came to pass, whenever the stronger livestock conceived, that Jacob placed the rods before the eyes of the livestock in the gutters, that they might conceive among the rods. But when the flocks were feeble, he did not put them in so that the feebler were Laban's and the stronger were Jacob's. Thus the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks, female and male servants, and camels and donkeys. Strange, isn't it? 
we read in verse 37 that Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar and of the almond and chestnut trees. When Jacob put these branches in the watering troughs of the flocks, it apparently increased the number of speckled and spotted offspring from that solid colored flock that Jacob managed on Laban's behalf. And through wise management of the herd, verse 42, the feebler, that's the livestock, the feebler livestock were Laban's and the stronger livestock were Jacob's. Jacob wisely used selective breeding practices to increase the strength and vitality of his flock. Now, friends, with this whole thing, with the peeled branches from the trees, the direction at which they looked, what they looked at when they conceived, we don't know exactly how this method worked. It's possible that Jacob knew things about animal husbandry that we don't know today. But I would say it's more likely that Jacob was just doing the best that he could, the best he knew how to do, and God blessed it. Now, by the way, later on, we're going to see this in the next chapter, Genesis chapter 31. But Genesis chapter 31 tells us that Jacob saw in a dream the blessed reproduction of speckled and spotted sheep and goats. That dream was also connected with a promise of God's care for Jacob and a command to return to Canaan, the land of his family. But the bottom line was this, verse 43, thus the man, thus Jacob, became exceedingly prosperous. The ancient Hebrew is phrased something like this, the man burst out exceedingly, exceedingly. God blessed Jacob, but it was not because Jacob was an especially good person. It was because of the promises God made to Jacob. You can find those back in Genesis chapter 28. And it was because of the covenant that God made to Abraham. In the same way, this applies to us, friends, uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ under the new covenant. Blessing comes from the Lord to his people, not because they are great, not because they are good, but because of the covenant God has made with his people through Jesus Christ and the many promises that he has given to his people in and through his word. Let me also note what if I could call these uh, Jacob's principles for prosperity. Jacob's principles for material success. First of all, don't make wealth your goal. Jacob's real goal was to return home. And the wealth was just a means to that. But wealth was not his primary goal. It was to return home. That's number one. Number two, don't be afraid to work for others and to try to increase their wealth before or as you work to increase your own wealth. That's what Jacob did. Is He worked diligently for his father-in-law Laban. He was increased on, focused on increasing his flocks. That's being a servant. That's being wise. Then third, work hard, dedicating yourself to your employer's success. And that's exactly what Jacob did. And then fourth, and maybe the most importantly, that's why I saved it for last, trust God. So don't make wealth your goal. Don't be afraid to work for others and try to make them prosperous. Work hard, dedicate yourself to your employer's success. And then finally, trust God. Those were four principles for prosperity, for material success, you could say, that were very evident in Jacob's life. All right, let's conclude here with just a couple observations of some ways that Genesis chapter 30 points to Jesus Christ. Now, this has sort of been my practice at the end of each one of these chapters to uh, consider a few ways that that particular chapter points to Jesus. And it's no different here at Genesis chapter 30. And and I've thought of a couple ways, but hey, maybe you can think of more. And and if you can think of more, just leave a response uh, in the comments as a response, as a post. Leave a response in some way if you can think of more ways uh, 
that Genesis chapter 30 points to Jesus Christ beyond the couple ways I'm going to mention now. Okay, here's one way that Genesis 30 points to Jesus Christ. The first one I have is this. The many sons of Jacob, 11 mentioned in this chapter and one more to come, will have an essential role in bringing forth Jesus the Messiah. Now, yes, only one of them would be the ancestor of Jesus. That would be Judah, the fourth son. He was mentioned at the end of Genesis chapter 29. But all of those sons will have their place in the community, the nation, the tribes that God will collectively bring forth through those sons, through those tribes, through that nation, Jesus the Messiah, and thus further God's great plan for the ages. Friends, God would use these sons. God would use these sons, uh, either directly or indirectly, to bring forth Jesus. And that was part of the purpose of God in bringing forth these 12 sons, 11 born up through the end of chapter 30, one more to be born. And then let me bring up a second point. Uh, don't you think these guys had a lot of brothers? 11 sons here that we have by the end of chapter 30. I guess seven of the sons were born in chapter 30, four were born in chapter 29, one more is going to be born in the future chapters. That's a lot of brothers. And Jesus has many brethren. Let me show to you Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. Listen carefully. It says this, For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified, in other words, both Jesus and his people, are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. I want you to think for a moment how Jesus Christ has many brethren. And if you are a child of God, if you are a son or a daughter of God by adoption, you are in God's family, and Jesus Christ is a brother to you. Jacob had sons. They had many brethren. Friends, you have many brethren in Jesus Christ, both in Jesus himself. Jesus is the one who has many brethren. But in the family of God, we collectively have many brethren. Yes, Jesus is the one who ultimately has many brethren. Hebrews 2.11 says that he's not ashamed to call them, to call us his brethren, as weak and failing as we may sometimes be. Friends, I hope there's encouragement for you here in this chapter. Let's pray in conclusion. Father in heaven, we're grateful for we see the compassion that you showed uh, to Leah, to Rachel. Lord, in, in many ways, they had this sinful competition. They uh, Things weren't right in their own lives in many ways, yet you still loved them and had compassion on them. When they cried out, you heard them. And Lord, we can be very aware of our own weaknesses and failings. But Lord, we cry out to you in sincerity and truth, and we ask that you would hear us. And Lord, I, I want to give a final prayer for those who desperately want to have children and have been to this point prevented. Lord, you have all these things within your sovereign plan and wisdom, but I pray that in your grace and mercy, you would grant an answer to those prayers and do so in the name of Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.